on this uh, Saturday of Holy Week, Holy Saturday, we remember what Jesus was achieving on the cross. Despite the fact that the disciples thought that he was dead and buried, he was actually achieving the greatest victory for us. And so tonight I, I'm going to attempt to talk about the atonement. Now that might be a, a, an unfamiliar word for some of you. The atonement, the word, was actually first coined by the English reformer William Tyndale. And he used that word to describe what Jesus did to reconcile us to God and God to us. It's a word that is made up by combining two words. It's literally the at one So the atonement is about what God and Christ did to achieve the at one between us and him. The atonement is about Christ's work focused on the cross that made reconciliation between our holy God and us as sinful human beings possible. Theologian Alistair McGrath starts one of his books on the atonement by saying, staleness is the curse of much of modern Christianity. Ideas and words and images have lost their freshness. What was once hot with the excitement of discovery has become cold and lacklustre. Why is there now something fatally wrong with them? Is it that the modern Christians reluctantly have been obliged to abandon the traditional ways of speaking about the meaning of the death and resurrection of Christ for us? No. The truth is something more disturbing and even scandalous. These great ideas, words and images have become stale. They have suffered the most degrading fate of all. They have become so familiar that they have began to seem tedious to us. We have taken them for granted like coins which have been in circulation for many years. They have become dulled through use. And what Alison McGrath is saying is that for all too many of us as contemporary Christians is that the cross isn't central, it's not something that, that's the pulsing heart of our faith. It's something that we've been taking for granted. And because we've taken it for granted, it's lost the impact that it should have on our heads, on our hearts and on our hands and the way that we act. And he talked about the cross becoming like a dull coin. And I believe that he's right. I believe that we need to rediscover the vitality of the cross and put the cross back in its central position. I believe that many of the problems that the church and individual Christians are experiencing today are as a result of us not fully understanding the meaning of the cross and so the cross is not as meaningful as it should be to us. When the cross doesn't have its rightful place in our thinking and living as Christians, then we as believers and as the church inevitably go wrong. In the last couple of decades, many theologians have rightly pointed out that the evangelical church has often neglected the importance of the incarnation. The incarnation is the doctrine of how Jesus, who is fully divine, also became fully human at the same time. And these theologians have argued that taking the incarnation seriously will make us seriously again take the example of Jesus and his teaching as seriously as it should be. And I think they're right. I think it is an absolute scandal that so many people who claim to be saved by Jesus on the cross don't live in the light of the teachings or follow the example of Jesus in their lives. Other biblical scholars and theologians have talked about the fact that we've been guilty of divorcing the cross from the resurrection. 
And you pointed out that without the resurrection, Jesus' death is a tragedy and perhaps an inspiration, but nothing more. And they're right. The resurrection vindicates what Jesus promised his death would achieve. As Brian Zahn tweeted recently, the resurrection is not the reversal of a defeat, but the revelation of God's victory. And there's no doubt that we need to remember that the resurrection is absolutely integral and vital to Christ's saving work. Nevertheless, having said all of that, I'm beginning to wonder if we have lost the, centri the centrality of the cross in the church and in our Christian lives. That we are not as focused on the cross as we should be. I believe that the cross has to be the focus of our attention and the shape of our thinking and experience as the church and as disciples of Jesus. I was always taught in the police that any claim to truth needs to be backed up by some credible witnesses who corroborate one another. And so to back up my claim that the cross needs to be central in Christian theology, mission and experience, I want to call three witnesses to back up my claim that we need to make the, the cross central once again in Christianity. And the first one is the Apostle Paul. Paul, writing to the troublesome church at Corinth, wanted to take them right back to the core foundations of the Christian faith to sort out all the problems in that church. And so in the opening chapters of 1 Corinthians, he focuses on the cross. In chapter 1, he says, We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. And in the next chapter, in chapter 2, he says, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus and him crucified. And Paul says that the heart, the essential essence of the message of Christianity is focused upon the cross of Christ. Now, if you read 1 Corinthians, you'll discover that Paul does not ex ignore the resurrection and the work of the Spirit. Far from it. But he knows where to put the focus when it comes to the saving work of God. And what he meant in those verses that we just read was that he was focusing on the central point of the gospel, which has to be the cross. Paul, when you read him in his theology, always leads with the cross and seeks to lead people back to the cross. He always started his world-changing message with the cross and centred his life-transforming message on the cross. The cross was absolutely central to Paul because he believed it was central to the gospel and the living of the Christian life. The cross to Paul not only saves us as Christians but must shape our lives as Christian communities and as individual Christians. In his letter, Paul makes it clear that the cross is both central to our salvation and to our sanctification. My next witness is the great German reformer Martin Luther, who has been called the theologian of the cross. In his day, uh, many medieval theologians taught that simply through reason and through looking at creation and logic, we could come to understand God. But in contrast, Luther said the cross alone is our theology. And he went on to say that he deserves to be a theologian. However, is only he who comprehends the, comprehends the visible and manifest things of God seen through suffering and the cross. And what Luther was saying was that there is no authentic knowledge and experience of God that does not come to us apart from the cross. The cross is so central that Luther says that the only way that you can know the truth about God, because that's what being a theologian means, and be saved by God is through the cross. The only person who is a true theologian is the one who understands God and his actions in the light of the cross. And Luther is saying that the cross is so central to Christian revelation that it is the focus of where God reveals his truth about himself and about humanity. 
The cross is central to Christian salvation and how it is how that God saves sinners. And we can summarise Martin Luther by saying that for him, the cross must be central because it's how God saves sinners and how sinners save how sinners know God. The cross is central because it is the very heart of Christian revelation and Christian salvation. My last witness is a fellow Scot, a theologian called P.T. Forsyth. When cross was when Forsyth was writing at the start of the 20th century, there were many liberal theologians diminishing the importance of the cross. And so in response, Forsyth wrote an important book called The Cruciality of the Cross. And in that book, Forsyth wrote that Christ is to us just what the cross is. All that Christ was in heaven or on earth was put into what he did there. You do not understand Christ till you understand his cross. And he goes on in that book to argue that the cross is essential to both the gospel and Christian experience. In opposition to those who were saying that Jesus was just another great religious teacher and what was important about him was his teaching, not his death. For Sai said to them and to us, you do not understand Christ till you understand his cross. And so what I'm arguing tonight, along with Apostle, the Apostle Paul and Martin Luther and P.T. Forsyth and so many others, is that the cross must be central to our understanding of God, to our experience of salvation and to our living of the Christian life. And now we've thought about the centrality and importance of the cross, we need to answer two basic questions. Who and why? Who died on the cross and why did they, debat, did they die? Let's address the one of who first. In the 11th century, Anselm, the Archbishop of, of Canterbury, wrote a book that is still influential today and he gave it the Latin title, Cur Deus Homo, which in Latin simply means, translated into English, why did God become man? Anselm's basic argument eh, goes like this, and we'll follow it. In order for sins to be forgiven, satisfaction must be made to God. His holiness and justice means that God cannot simply ignore the seriousness of humanity's sin. Only a human being ought to make satisfaction for sin, but they cannot. As human beings, we cannot fix our sin problem ourselves. We cannot save ourselves. When it comes to sin, we are the problem and not part of the solution. Only God can make the satisfaction for sin, but he ought not to. And since only man ought to make satisfaction for sin, but only God can, that satisfaction for sin must be made by a God-man, one who is fully human and divine at the same time, which is why Jesus became a human being. And so Anselm was saying that on the cross, it was God incarnate, God fully human and yet no less fully divine that died to deal with their sin. On the cross, God himself died voluntarily as the only way for humanity's sin problem to be dealt with. And Anselm, I believe, was building on the work of an earlier church father called Gregory of Nazianzus. And he wrote famously about salvation, that which is not assumed he, that's meaning Jesus, has not healed. But that which is united to his Godhead is also saved. Now, that seems a little bit unfamiliar to, to our ears. But what Gregory taught was that unless Jesus assumed real humanity, a real human nature, then that humanity could not be healed. And of course, healed there means saved from sin. So the person who died on the cross had to be fully human as well as fully divine at the same time. 
Now, why is it so important for us to realise that it was God incarnate dying on the cross? Well, it reminds us that Jesus was not some unrelated third party to God's just complaint against us for our sin. If Jesus was just an innocent human being, we might have reason to balk at the apparent injustice of his substitutionary death on the cross for us. But the incarnation reminds us that Jesus was no disinterested or detached observer. He was the Word made flesh, God incarnate, and as the second person of the Godhead in his divinity, he stood in perfect union with God, the very one who had the complaint against us. And yet, as fully man in his humanity, he stands in perfect solidarity with us being like us in every way except being without sin. Now that we've thought that it had to be the one who was fully human and fully divine who died for us to deal with our sin, let's think about why he died and unpack that uh, part about sin more fully. Well, at one level, Jesus died for religious and political reasons. The Jewish authorities had Jesus killed for blasphemy. And sadly, still today, innocent people are killed by religious people because in their view, they don't believe the right things. Think about what ISIS has done recently in Mozambique. Pilate had Jesus killed for sedition, for political reasons. And all around the world, political people who are in power kill innocent people to keep their power. Just think of Burma at the moment. Now, we shouldn't discount those reasons for Jesus' death. Because Jesus was killed for political and religious re reasons. And that means that we as Christians must be utterly and implacably opposed to religious and political violence. It is a scandal of church history and a shame on Christianity that the church has all too often had people killed for religious le reasons and supported those who have killed innocent people for political reasons. 49 years before Jesus was born, Julius Caesar, not too far from here, led an army from what is now France today across a river called the Rubicon and into Italy. Now, lots of people crossed the Rubicon River. It was not unusual. But you see, the Rubicon was the border between the territory that was directly governed by the Roman Senate. And the significance of crossing it with an army was that Caesar was declaring war on the Senate. And so what that reminds us is to understand a historical event, we don't just need to know that it happened, but also why it happened, the significance of the event. And sadly, crucifixion wasn't unusual in the Roman Empire. The Romans once crucified so many people in Judea at the one time that they actually ran out of wood. And so the significance of Jesus' death is not simply that as a historical fact he was crucified, but it lies in why he was crucified and what that death meant. We believe that the writers of the New Testament were inspired by the Holy Spirit to explain to us the significance of Jesus' death. And that's why what we want to do now is turn to the New Testament. People write whole PhDs on just one aspect of what the New Testament says that Jesus died on, on one aspect of why Jesus said the New Testament says Jesus died. So tonight, we're not going to be able to exhaustively explain the meaning of the cross in a few minutes. In fact, I realise that no matter what you say about the meaning of the cross, there is always more to say. But what I want us to do is focus in the main ways in which the New Testament talks about the significance of Jesus' death. At the most basic level, the New Testament simply says that Jesus died for us. And so, for instance, in Romans 8, we are 
told God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, in what sense did he die for us? I think the New Testament explains that in two ways. He died for us in dying in our place. The cross was an act of substitution. And he died for us by dying for our benefit. The cross was a way of obtaining salvation through substitution. Now let's take that a bit further. I would say that there are three main ways that the New Testament speaks about Jesus' death. The theologian uh, Roger Olson summarises this teaching of the New Testament about the work of Christ in a really helpful way. This is what he says. According to the New Testament and Christian tradition, Christ's work on the cross, what he did for us sinners to reconcile us with God, has many facets and dimensions. Our authors focus on three. Christ as the victor over the devil, sin and death. Christ as transformer of our lives by the example and influence of the cross and Christ as substitute who took our place and suffered the penalty we deserved for our defection from God and resulting sin. And so we could summarise what Olson says about the New Testament teaching on the cross in these ways. First of all, the cross is a sacrifice for our sin that brings forgiveness and reconciliation from God and with God. I want to read to you this hugely important passage from the book of Romans. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, been witnessed by the law and prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace, through the redemption which is in Jesus Christ, who displayed, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously con- committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ Jesus. Now in a nutshell, what that passage tells us and talks about is the image of the cross as a sacrifice. It tells us that our sin requires punishment and that God is angered by sin and opposed to it. And that out of love, the Son of God, as the man Jesus, suffered the punishment in our place so that we can be forgiven and reconciled with God. Those verses tell us that God did this by becoming a propitiation for our sin. And that word propitiation and the idea comes from the world of sacrifice. And it means a sacrifice that turns away and satisfies God's wrath, God's anger. And because Jesus' death satisfies God's wrath against our sins, we are forgiven. Recently, this view has been much criticised with some people like British evangelist and pastor Steve Chalk calling it divine child abuse. Now, there's no doubt that this way of understanding the cross has sometimes been badly distorted and caricatured. So it sounds like A loving Jesus saves us from an angry God. But I think the source of these criticisms is the false idea that Jesus Christ was an innocent human being on whom God took out his wrath. These critics forget that the New Testament and good theology say that Jesus Christ was God himself by the plan of God voluntarily suffering our punishment because God loves us and desires to forgive us and be reconciled with us. The loving God in Christ voluntarily takes our place and takes upon himself the punishment for our sins. And he does this out of love. 
This is no divine child abuse. Secondly, the New Testament can be summarised as saying the cross is a victory over Satan, death and the powers of darkness that brings us freedom. New Testament says when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross and having disarmed the powers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. In the ancient world, when an enemy was defeated, they were disarmed. Their weapons were taken away and so they were rendered powerless. They were then made a public spectacle of. They were made to walk through Roman towns and cities in chains, showing that they were defeated and no longer had any power to threaten the Roman citizens. And in Colossians, we are told that on the cross, Jesus defeated the powers of darkness. He disarmed them. He rendered them powerless. On the cross we see that Satan, sin and the powers of darkness and death are for the Christian defeated enemies whose power we have been liberated from. C.S. Lewis spoke about Christ's victory on the cross being like the liberation of Europe from the power and oppression of the Nazis in World War II. C.S. Lewis said that we should imagine ourselves being in a European city and hearing about D-Day, that there was a far-off battle and that the occupying power that had oppressed us has been decisively defeated and now is in retreat. It's inevitable that the Nazis will now be driven out of every country they have occupied and so final defeat is inevitable. And C.S. Lewis said it's the same for us living between the cross and the return of Jesus. In one sense, victory has been decisively won. In another sense, final victory is still to come. But our enemy is defeated, if still dangerous. The important point is that we can now live in the light of that victory as free, the liberated people. And finally, the New Testament talks about the cross as an example and inspiration in life that transforms how we live. The writers of the New Testament say that the cross doesn't just objectively save us from sin, but it also shapes our lives. It has a subjective impact on us. It inspires us to follow the example of Jesus, to embrace his values and so love others as he has loved us. So the Apostle of Love says in 1 John, this is how we know what love is. Christ Jesus laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. The New Testament teaches that those who are truly saved by the cross will live a life of love shaped by the example and the values of the cross. So what impact does understanding the cross in this way have as a result? Well, I think that the New Testament teaches that the cross has an objective impact. It has an objective impact on God. The way in which we relate to God and the powers of evil has changed because of the cross. It results in changed relationships between God and us and God and, sorry, and us and the powers of darkness. But the cross also has a subjective impact on us. Because of what we experience through the cross, the cross transforms our life. It inspires us and guides us into a new lifestyle of love that follows the example of the cross and the way it treats others. Here's what I mean in this graphic. The impact of the cross means that God has an impact on God. It propitiates his wrath, which means that it results in forgiveness and reconciliation for us. The cross has an impact on Satan, death and the powers of darkness. It breaks their power and so it brings freedom to our lives. And finally, the cross has an impact on us. 
It transforms our lives by showing us how to live a life of love. I've been arguing tonight that the cross must be central in how we live as the church, how we proclaim the gospel and how we live the Christian life. And what I mean by that is that we need to understand the cross in those three ways and to live out those implications of forgiveness and reconciliation, of freedom and love. Now we could talk until next week and not exhaust the implications of the cross, but I want to end by thinking about three in three particular ways in which it's vital that we connect with the cross as God's people. And the first is the area of the cross and self-esteem. Over the last 30 years as a pastor, I've lost count of the number of conversations I've had with people about their problems. And many of these problems can be traced back to issues around self-esteem. The basic problem is that some of us think too highly of ourselves and are full of pride and some of us think too lowly of ourselves and believe our, ourselves to be worthless. I'm going to suggest to you that the only way that we can have a healthy self-esteem is through understanding the cross. Because you see, the cross simultaneously critiques us and affirms us as human beings. Listen to this familiar verse from Romans. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now what does that verse tell you about yourself? It tells you that you're a sinner. Emil Brunner once wrote that in every other religion, humanity is spared the final humiliation of knowing that the mediator, Jesus Christ, must bear the punishment instead of him. He is not stripped absolutely naked, but the gospel strips us naked. We have no clothing in which to appear before God and declares us morally bankrupt. We have no currency with which to buy the favour of heaven. You see, the cross robs us of all pride and self-righteousness. The cross confronts us with the truth that we are sinners, that we are morally bankrupt. And yet, the cross also tells you that you are somebody who is loved and valued by God. No one can look at the cross and say they are worthless. The cross tells us that we are loved by God. Julius Caesar was once captured by pirates and was incensed when he heard what price they demanded for his ransom. He thought it was too little. Because you see, the importance we are to someone increases the price that they will pay for our freedom. The more valuable we are to someone, the more we are loved by someone, the more they will be willing to pay for our freedom. So what price was God willing to pay to ransom you, to set you free? Peter tells us that we have been redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. And let me tell you, there is nothing more precious in the universe than that. You are so loved by God that he gave the most valuable thing he had for you, the life of his son. You are so loved by Christ that he gave the most valuable thing he had, his very life, to ransom you. And so if we want to develop a healthy self-esteem that stops us from thinking too highly or too lowly of ourselves, that stops us filling ourselves with pride or believing that we are worthless, we have to understand and live in the light of the cross. Next, we need to connect with the cross because the cross deals with prejudice. One of the big issues of our day is prejudice and discrimination. Racial prejudice and discrimination on the grounds of gender or class. 
I want to suggest that we can only get our thinking straight about those things when we let the cross straighten our thinking. I don't know if you're aware of this, but the very first statement in history of the fundamental equality of all human beings, no matter their race, gender or social position, is actually in the New Testament. It's in the book of Galatians. For there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And Paul says that because of Jesus, because of what he's done for us on the cross, there can no longer be division in humanity based on race, gender or social position. There can be no discrimination to or hostility towards others in the church. The cross does not just reconcile us to God, it reconciles us to one another. The cross is the ultimate remedy to the ongoing injustice of racism. In Ephesians 2 we are told, For he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. New Testament scholar Scott McKnight writes about those verses. According to Ephesians, the crucifixion tears down the dividing wall of hostility between ethnic groups and makes one people who reveal the reconciling power of the gospel to a world ravaged by hostility and division. As the Egyptian church father Athanasius wrote in his book on the Incarnation, it is only on the cross that a man dies with its arms outstretched that he might draw his ancient people with the one and the Gentiles with the other and join both together in himself. The cross severs the root of racism and builds up a community of people of different cultures and ethnic cities united in Christ. As a church, we must embody this implication of the cross. There is no place for discrimination and prejudice based on race, gender or class. And in society, we must express this implication of the cross by standing for racial justice and against racial, gender and class discrimination wherever we find it. This is particularly important to us as an international church. We need to keep the cross central to keep the evil of racism and prejudice at bay in our community. And finally, I want to talk about the cross and forgiveness. The final area where I think it is vital for us to connect with the cross as a church is in the area of forgiveness. Unforgiveness is the scandal and the shame of the church. There are church members who won't forgive fellow believers. There are Christian husband and wives who won't forgive their spouses. And finally, there are believers who won't forgive themselves. And the truth is that this unforgiveness is poisoning churches, killing Christian marriages and driving believers to despair. And its only antidote is the cross. The cross tells all three groups that unforgiveness is not an option to those who have been saved and experienced forgiveness through the cross and who now must live by the example of the cross. If Jesus could embrace the pain of the cross to forgive us, there is nothing that others can do that can put them beyond our forgiveness. And that includes ourselves. I want to read to you something especially for those among us who find it difficult to forgive ourselves. It's a quote from a Christian counsellor. Guilt is one of the devil's most utilised weapons against the Christian. 
because sin yet remains in our lives and many live with the daily struggle to overcome it. The enemy of our soul often seeks to convince us to doubt the efficacy of God's grace and the assurance of his mercy. He knows feelings of guilt and shame can be overwhelming and can lead to despair. If the enemy can get you to despair and to wallow in your failures, he can keep you from living in the freedom Christ secured for you on the cross. And thus he can bind you in a new kind of slavery, daily living below the dignity of your freedom in Christ and the joy of your salvation. And whenever we refuse to forgive ourselves, we are repudiating the power of the cross and doubting the love of Christ. We tell Christ that while he may have died for the sins of the whole world, we have a sin that is beyond his power to forgive through his death. There's a story that while the early church father Augustine was working on his book on the Trinity, trying to explain God, he was walking by the seaside one day, meditating on the difficult problem of how God could be three persons at once. And he met a young boy who dug a hole in the sand and was with a seashell, scooping water from the sea and putting it into the hole. Augustine watched him for a while and finally asked the child what he was doing. The boy answered and said that he was going to scoop all the water from the sea and pour it into the little hole. What Augustine said, that's impossible. Obviously the sea is too large and the hole too small. Indeed, said the young boy, but I will sooner draw all the water from the sea and empty it into this hole than you will succeed in fully understanding God. Well, I think I know how Augustine felt at that moment. Having said all that I've said about the cross, I am so aware that I have come nowhere near explaining its full significance and wonder. There is so much more to be said and the cross is beyond our explanation. I want to give the last words on the cross to Charles Wesley. For Wesley reminds us that the cross transcends all of our attempts at explanation and ultimately should instead draw us to adoration and wonder. I'll say these words, I won't sing them. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain for me who him to death pursued. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Tis mystery all, the immortal dies. Who can explore his strange design? In vain the firstborn seraph tries to sound the depth of love divine. Tis mystery all let earth adore and let angels' minds inquire no more. Amen. <laughs>